Good morning. <clears throat> Happy uh, January 25th day. Hope you all are having a wonderful day. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I am going to do a very short introduction because I feel like our speaker today is uh, going to be able to introduce uh, the topic really well, which will introduce him really well. But we have uh, Pastor Tony Wood coming uh, to join us today. He has come all the way from Orange County, California. And so I, I'm actually just going to leave it at that. Tony, if you want to come on forward, um, I'm excited about what he has to say. And I'm going to, I don't want to, I don't want to steal his thunder or anything. So come on forward. Y'all give it up for Pastor Tony. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you for having me and allowing me to come and fly all the way out here. It is um, a very, very cold place to be. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I honestly have never experienced cold like this ever. Um, you know, I got off the plane and I, I thought, man, I don't have the right clothes for this. I actually looked at my phone and my daughter and I were coming and, and we looked and it said seven degrees. And so I went over to my wife's closet and I pulled out a scarf. And I wore my wife's scarf uh, this morning um, because I literally do not have clothes for this kind of weather. Um, the only things that I really know about Kansas City um, is, you know, that number one, it's cold. Number two is that you have an incredible quarterback. Uh, that's the other thing. So I'm sorry for your loss last Sunday. That was a tough one. Uh, we have, I'm assuming there's a lot of Patrick Mahomes fans here uh, this, this, this morning, right? We got a few of them? Okay. So it's cold, you have a good quarterback, and then the other thing I know is you have a great um, president in Dr. Chris Cohn, uh, and there's a lot of neat stuff happening here at the university. So maybe that would be a good alliteration. Cold, quarterback, and then uh, Calvary University is a good place to be. Um, but after doing some research, I realized that also there's one other thing that springs out of um, Kansas City, and I know you know this, but I want to just take a second to remind you of it, uh, which is heresy. So cold and quarterback and a wonderful university at Calvary, but also another thing that you know globally, which is springing out of Kansas City, is formal in many ways and definitely material heresy. Uh, about a, a, two years ago now, one of my best friends, Costi Hinn, who's the nephew of uh, Benny Hinn, uh, wrote a book called Defining Deception, where he details in it uh, the advent of the mystical miracle movement springing out of uh, Bethel Church in Reading, Bill Johnson, and Jesus Culture, uh, and a lot of the bands and music that we now sing today. Todd White, the NAR, and of course as well, uh, what's happening at IHOP with Mike Bickle. I heard Mike Bickle was here for a counterpoint with Dr. Cohn. Um, but it's very important this morning, and I, I, I want to put this in front of you, to understand that the music that is being sung in many churches is stemming from false prophets. And I know that we are, you are, I'm old now, a generation of people who are taught tolerance. But I want to put in front of you this morning, simply and, and very shortly and briefly, the fact that the, many of the songs that you have uh, on your phone, potentially even at this school, uh, are written by false prophets. And many of the stage-sharing conferences that you see in your land today, in our country today, um, boast false prophets. And formal heresy, historically speaking, is different from material heresy in that these are men who have been told they're wrong and they're outside Christian orthodoxy, and yet they continue to proclaim error. Formal heresy comes along about once every 100 years in new form, and it requires a generation of young people to rise up, and here's the key, fight for the fundamentals once again. See, a generation rises, and they fight for fundamental truth. In fact, I can even look around this room right now as I sit here and tell who the fighters are, the fighters for truth, that as I talk, I see it in your eyes. I see you begin to nod your head. I know you know the landscape, and you can tell the air, and you want to step up and proclaim truth for Jesus Christ. 
But then a second generation comes and they begin to fancy the truth, the fundamentals. And they say, oh, wow, someone fought for us. Let's enjoy the rewards of the harvest. And then a third generation comes along and it fades. It goes from fighting to fancying to fading. And then the fourth generation never knows what it had. And what Bill Johnson and Mike Bickle and Todd White and Gateway Church and Robert Morris and yes, even the wonderful, beloved Carrie Job, all of them are doing is desecrating the word of God and then sending out the missionary, which is the music around the world, as young people gobble it up because it makes them, it makes us feel good. Well, Jesus culture makes me feel good. Oh, I feel closer to God as I listen to it. I can practice the presence of God as I listen to it. Meanwhile, the theology behind it and the people behind it are wolves who are destroying sheep around the world. Now, there's still a few of you, I would imagine, that are going, dude, this guy's crazy. He comes from California and he yells at us. It took him five minutes and he's yelling at us. Who is this, John MacArthur? (laughs) Now, I... I do come from Southern California, but let me prove it to you real quick. Let me prove it to you. Uh, Number one, they desecrate the word of God. How do you know somebody is in formal heresy? Number one, they desecrate the word of God. And Bill Johnson's famous sermon where he takes the stage, some of you, a lot of you have seen it because you know, you go on YouTube and there it is, is he stands up to proclaim why they have gold dust and glory clouds falling and feathers in their church service, and here's what he says. It was about 15 years ago that the feathers started falling in the meetings, and then in our homes, and then in restaurants, you know, the signs that make you wonder. People say, well, where's that in your Bible? Well, God said he'd cover you with his feathers, and then his whole congregation laughs nervously. Well, that's not literal, they say, and more laughter. Bill Johnson says, and that's what I thought. I thought it wasn't literal, But it also says there's healing in his wings. Now, it doesn't take a Hebrew scholar here, friends, to note that Hebrews chapter 91, the psalm written by Moses, isn't speaking literally about the feathers of God. It doesn't take a Hebrew scholar to realize that he's not talking literally there. It's a metaphor, an analogy, and a poetic prose. Bill Johnson's not standing. Read the rest of Psalm 91 as you get on your way home today or back to the dorms, wherever you're going. And he doesn't talk about hundreds of Bill Johnson's followers being struck dead next to him. Or Bill Johnson's not being shot shot by an archer with an arrow, is he? So obviously it's metaphorical. Friends, what we've just watched on YouTube, as has 40,000 other people, is the moment that a shepherd stands on stage in front of his sheep and says what? Number one, I don't take the the word of God literally anymore. Number two, If you're experiencing a sign, then that means it's God. And number three, our theology is driven by our experience, not our experience driven by our theology. And you've just watched like the big bully back in the junior high playground. Him walk over, set up the little guy, give him a punch before they even knew what question to ask, knocking him down. That's what bullies and wolves do. And from that point on, those sheep sitting there at Bethel Church in Reading and for millions of people around the world who would listen to their songs were under the manipulation of Bill Johnson. As he said, you base what you do on my word and not on God's word. In fact, last August, um, does anyone here, everyone here knows about IHOP and Mike Bickle, right? That's old news, um, right? Anybody here ever been to the church or been to, it's not a church, uh, anybody ever been to the thing? All right, three of you. Good. Mike Bickle in Open Heavens 17, uh, or actually on Sid Roth's show, Supernatural, um, was asked, Mike, how how did you start your ministry? And uh, Sid Roth asked him, and Bickle said, I was reading a wedding invite. And it said, this is a wedding invite that he was reading, Song of Solomon 8.6. I will set a fire on your heart. Bickle says, and I wept. And the power of God came over me, he said. And then the Lord sealed me with a heart of fire. And then a prophet called my phone and he said, I had an audible voice telling me that God was going to visit you today, Bickle, and preach Song of Solomon 8-6 the rest of your life. Now, you are students at a literal, historical, grammatical university and college under the tutelage of Dr. Chris Cohn. Please tell me, is Song of Solomon talking in 8-6 about the power of God's love coming down and infusing a man 
for signs and wonders? Or is Song of Solomon talking about the bride of Solomon and his Shulamite bride? Which one is it? Think hard. It's a great debate for your Hebrew course. But let me just suggest to you that to say your ministry is based off a twist of scripture starts you off in a pattern where you end up long term where Bickle has ended up. If you do not base your ministry in the word of God, you end up basing it in experience and you end up with the international house of prayer or the international house of pillage. They desecrate not only the word of God, but they desecrate the gospel of God. There was a recent IHOP prophecy conference bulletin. This, listen to this. This is the bottom of Bickle's bulletin. It says, the Lord said, if you sow that million dollars into the harvest, then I will release a million souls. Check that out. If you give me a million dollars, then I'm going to give you a million souls. Now, friends, you ever see anywhere in the Bible that God's actually given you an exact payout for what you can purchase? How about this one, the famous Joel Osteen in his infamous Best Life Now? If you want to reap financial blessings, you got to sow financial seeds. And then Bill Johnson again, When Heaven Invades Earth. This is my favorite one. Listen to this. This shyster says, the failure to be healed is a lack of faith. Stop. The failure to be healed is a lack of faith, he says. Anybody here sick this morning? It's been cold. You struggling? A little flu bug? You know why you're sick? That's why I come to Calvary University, man. You sick because it's cold, man. He goes on and says, sickness is to the body. Listen close. What sin is to the soul? Is anyone starving in heaven, he says? Of course not. God's dominion should be seen here on earth, he says, abundant supply. I ask you, does the Bible attribute sickness to faithlessness or hellish disease? Exodus 4.11 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, says the Lord? Does the Bible promise a health and wealth payout for faith? Jesus didn't think so, Matthew 5.10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Paul didn't think so, Romans 5, 3, when he said we rejoice in our sufferings. James didn't think so, James 1, 2, count it all joy when you meet trials. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, we don't lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, this bile of bones is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, not the temporal, not the broken, not the body, not the sickness, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen or which are seen are temporal, but the things which are seen are eternal. Friends, only a dirty shyster like Bill Johnson driving a $250,000 Aston Martin would dare call out the faith of people around the world simply because they're suffering. You mean to tell me this morning that Johnny Erickson Tata does not have faith? I call you a shyster. You mean to tell me that Nick Vujicic without his arms and legs is simply struggling from faith? I call you a shyster. You mean to tell me that my brothers and sisters around the world who are martyred in China, who are poor and starving but serving the church in Kenya, are, are simply struggling from faith? I call you a shyster. I call you a devil. I call you a demon. You mean to tell me that my friend who gave up his career in business to go serve in the slums of Baguio at the, the pile of a mountain of garbage to serve children and is dying of lung cancer because of it is somebody who struggles with faith? I call those people Christian warriors. What do you call them? Only the devil would say such things. They desecrate the word of God. They desecrate the good news, the gospel of God. And then finally, the one that we never can let pass is they desecrate the son himself of God. Journey with me back 1,600 years, theologians. Do you remember? There was a rogue named Arius. Do you remember him? There he was off in the distance teaching that Jesus was a half-god, a firstborn 
just like us. Constantine knew this would be a problem, and so what does he do? He calls together a bunch of men, and for years they sit around in Nicaea, And realize that if we teach a depleted Jesus, not 100% God and not 100% man, we end up with a pagan Christianity. So they tell Arius, you're out. Listen to the first chapter. One line from Bill Johnson's seminal, When Heaven Invades Earth, he says, Jesus performed miracles, wonders, and signs as a man in right relationship with God and not as God. Your Kansas City resident, Mike Bickle, in Open Heaven 17 conference said, Jesus the man won back authority. The man defeated Satan. He did it as a man. Jesus the man said, I'll rise again. Friends, these people shout again and again that Jesus was just a man and it was the power of the Spirit that did the work. And they shout that so that they can tell everybody that they too can be a Jesus. But 1,600 years ago, the church already declared that kind of theology is out. Let me ask you, future preachers and teachers of America and the world, if a man desecrates the word of God and a man desecrates the good news of God and a man desecrates the son of God, should he be allowed to train and teach and shepherd the people of God? Do not buy the music. It's their missionary. And when you buy the music, you support the false prophecy, the false teaching, and the apostasy. And listen to me, young men and women. I don't care if there is only one young preacher, true preacher in this room. And true preachers are those who take the lectern, they take the pulpit, they don't care what's on their right or left, they declare the word of God, and they take the arrows because of it. If there's only one of you, listen to me now, preach the word. Corrux and ton log on, preach the word. And let the chips fall where they may. But do not let your generation go quietly into the night. Do not let the heretics take the fights of the past and the fancies of the past and let it fade quietly into the night. You stand up and fight for truth. Let Kansas City be known for its cold, its quarterback, in Calvary University, but not for its heresy. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I know that this is a brief time that we have here together this morning, but I'm asking you that right now, this moment, I'm asking you for the one. Out of the hundreds of students and future world changers that are gathered in here that you will take into the course of their life. Some of them into business and some of them into teaching and some of them into retail, some into government and some into politics, and some into social change and some to be wonderful mothers of children at home and I'm asking you, Lord, for the one. I don't know who he or she is, and I do not know the preacher that he is, but I'm asking you right now that you would create a new burning deep inside of him, that his mind would begin to dwell on your word in a new way. That he would know in this moment beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is called to the pulpit, 
that he will search out anywhere he can counsel from the men who are around him, that he will stay up in the late hours of the night, that he will wake up in the early dawn, kneeling with his word in front of him, begging the Holy Spirit to fill him with the truths of Scripture, that he will put away the sexual sins and entanglements, that he will commit to searching out the living God and teaching for the living God, even if it means he remain unmarried, that he will know from this point forward that he will not allow false teaching to desecrate his land, that he will stand for the glory and the beauty and the delight of Jesus Christ his Lord. And he will do so unashamed. I ask you now, right now, Lord, for the one. Create an urgency in him. Let him not rest until he calls people to Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Oh, no, you don't oh, get away I yet. I forgot. You get to sit with me. I forgot. It's too I cold. Yet. I need to go home. <laughs> you don't get to run away that easy. Come on now. <laughs> so, uh, gonna. you had mentioned at the beginning, you said, uh, you know, it's five minutes in and the guy's yelling at me already. I know. I do that. I'm That's so okay. sorry. No, but I'm that, really not like that all the time. See, I, I'm, I'm, I'm nice most of the time. Right, Peyton? I'm pretty nice at home. Okay. Tell the truth. No. <laughs> um, so, and, and I, I, I do that too. I'll, I'll, my voice tends to just, the more I talk about something, the kind of the higher and higher and louder I get. Yeah. And, it, and it, I, I think it just comes because I'm passionate about something, right? And that, and that comes across as, yeah. as, as just an increase in volume, constant. But do you believe uh, you're speaking harshly? I, I've heard it from some people that they, they respond to me and say, what? why are you talking like that? You know, you're supposed to be kind and loving and things like that. And so um, if someone was to come up to you and say um, you're being prideful or harsh or unchrist like what's your response to that? Why, why, you know, why, do you, why would you disagree if you do? I, I understand. And I, I, I do think that there's, first off, a, a different in intonation when we're, obviously, when we're, when we're preaching and we're talking about God's word versus our own word. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my word you know, my word, who cares? Um, I could care less. Um, I think, you know, what a, what a person tweets, puts on Facebook, um, social media, we could, should care less, whatever. Public opinion, the court of public opinion, whatever. We need to be humble and, and kind. I, I do think, though, that when a man takes a pulpit and says, thus saith the Lord, um, he's an ambassador, a herald for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he needs to be willing to take no prisoners. Not to say that there aren't parts of Scripture that have a much nicer ethos um, and pathos, but I, I think overall there are times, especially when we're calling out false teaching, um, that we need to simply say, thus declares um, the Lord. So I, I tend to bifurcate those. Yeah. Um, I, I do think, to be honest, too, um, as you well know, that there has been a dumbed-down version of teaching in, in, in evangelicalism right. and in preaching, mm. where it's not even really preaching anymore. It's simply, how can I get up here and share just enough to make these people like me of opinion um, and to keep coming back and feeding the economic engine of churches? Right. And so, by and large, you, you guys would know better than I, um, even the majority of seminaries anymore aren't, aren't training people to be proper expositors and preachers. Right. They're training them to be nice guys with sermonettes. So I want to touch just a little bit on the music aspect. Um, you had mentioned, you know, Bethel and, and Hillsong and Jesus Culture, and I think I think you named all three of those specifically. Um, arguably, there are some of their songs that would uh, get by with um, biblical accuracy, right? Yep, that, that, absolutely. That, that some of their that some of their music, I could say, yeah, I, I agree with the words of that song, mm -hmm. right? And so. Uh, why you had mentioned supporting them by buying their music. What's the difference between doing that and maybe doing it with secular music, or is there a difference? Great question. Right? Yeah. Are we about to go into a Jesus Culture song after this? <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, the, the, I just picture the worship team back there, and they're like, oh, no, you know, sorry, <laughs> crazy California guy. <laughs> 
everyone waits. That's everyone waits till I leave, and then they just break out in song. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I have people ask me that all the time we, when we wrote the book. It was like, okay, you know, this guy had slaves, and this guy, you know, got divorced, and why do we sing Ray Bolt, but we can't sing you know, all these old people? It, it's real simple to me, guys. It's real simple. Try. We're all sinners, right? So you and I, if we wrote a worship song, you know. You don't want me to write a word. No, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you don't want me to sing it, right? So yeah. thank goodness that the, our full body of work is looked at in ministry because if people only, like, look, when they look at me up to 20, they're like, who's that prodigal kid, you know, that he shouldn't even be standing up there. So right. I think there's a difference, though, between sin, and that's why I'm clarifying these things, and then formal heresy. We need to be very, very patient and kind. We all are singing songs written by sinners, and whatever, you know, that's great. Um, and as long as they have the truth and proper theology in them, sing them to the rooftops. However, there's a difference when we can quantify that this individual is, in fact, propagating error intentionally. Mm -hmm. Because then what we're doing is we're fiscally supporting error. We're saying, hey, we know that this is all disseminating out of the pit of hell, so let's pay $9.99 for the album, and then we'll help it along. That's the difference. So I have nothing in my mind that would stop someone from singing a song that's written by a sinner saved from grace. I think that's what we all do. It's when we know that it is, um, that it's, it's literally, in my, in my humble opinion, demonic, that we support it where we cross the line. I think it's just wise to stay away from it. Um, and the reality is, is for leaders, we may know the truths, but if you put a song up and you have to put that little CCLI mark on the mm -hmm. bottom, yeah. your people, like let's say you stop at the cliff ledge as a leader, um, you know, your people are just going to fall right out. They, they don't know the difference. All they know is, oh, our church sings this. So they go home and get into this. Then they go, where'd this cool stuff come from? Well, I'm going to go online and find this. Then I find him, and then they're led by um, a wolf. So I would, I would probably draw a distinction. Okay. So I'm going to push a little bit more just for, for clarity's sake. Come on, bring it. So we've got, e even in that, you had mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the sinners saved by grace who are, are, are writing songs, but then those who are uh, uh, purposefully writing songs that are wrong. Okay. But what about the person that has nothing to do with Jesus and is out there writing lyrics, uh, not necessarily Christian lyrics at all, but we're supporting them and because we like their music? So what I'm asking, oh, is, there, a is there a distinction between, okay, I'm buying a Christian or, or acclaimed Christian's music that's, that's talking about Scripture and Jesus and things like that wrongly? Is there a difference between that and buying the music from the guy that doesn't care anything about Jesus and has no lyrics, spiritual lyrics at all in his albums. Do you see what I'm saying? Both ways, I'm Absolutely. fiscally supporting somebody that disagrees with me. What's let, the difference? let me just stay away from the method and all the applications and go right mm -hmm. to the principle of it. Okay. In our home, we're really big believers on, you know, Colossians chapter 3. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let the word richly dwell within you and then the modifying participles there, you know, and in your singing and hymns. And to me, cr real Christians yeah. are going... What comes out of me, what I enjoy, right. what overflows, um, to use the, you know, the, gr the grammar of Paul, what overflows out of this vessel is all of the Lord. I, I think the desire that we have for music that is not honoring the Lord um, is a, an indicator of, of who we are on the inside. Mm -hmm. So if I want to listen to Lady Gaga and Lady Gaga is exploding out of me, um, that gives me a really clear indicator of what I'm about. Okay. And so for us in our home, um, we are big advocates of singing songs that are rooted in scripture and not playing around and toying with things of the world. Okay. That's, I'm going to just leave it at that. Because if I go good. any further, they'll think I'm John MacArthur again. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so we'll move away from music for a minute. How can we pray for our IHOP brethren who have been led by false teachings? Well, we need to remember that this is a rescue operation for all of the sheep. And um, we need to do it with tears. We, we should preach with a moist eye. Um, gosh, you know, just to think of, uh, I'll give you an example in our life of Costi and uh, his, his parents. You know, obviously his uncle is, is off the reservation, but, um, you know, I don't know if we're recording this, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that. I think that there are people in our life, all of us would know them, who even right now as we sit here are caught up in prosperity and word of faith in mystical miracle signs and wonders and we need to do it through a moist eye we call it ptsd i think number one you keep the communication lines open with them mm -hmm. don't shut them down don't become the preacher who's hardline 
and says, I'm not talking to you anymore. Keep the conversation open. Pray for a breaking point so that when they hit rock bottom, they come to you as a bastion of truth. Right. And then be ready with your answers in scripture for them. Because as God calls them to faith, they will be brought to the bottom and realize that the sand upon which they built their house is shallow and it does fall. And if you have obliterated your relationship with them, you have no shot. Um, you're not the one they call. So be patient and sensitive. Be ready. Be praying for their broken moment. And then number three, be ready with the right scriptures to show them who Christ really is. Um, that'd be my answer. Thank you. Callie, go for it. It's a great question. To repeat the question, may I repeat it? You want me to repeat it for everybody? Her question is really good. She says, um, when we're talking about scripture and use words like demonic, these are very important words. And we're talking about something inherently evil. And so to use that in association with this music, are, am I saying that the music and listening to it in and of itself is demonic or would be an act of evil? Okay, great question. Um, yes. Your prequel question. Okay. This is Tolkien. It's coming in three parts. Okay. Um, 700 pages. So two minutes. we have two minutes for 700 pages. Are you ready? Yep. Number one would simply be when I use demonic, when I use devil, when I use pit of hell, um, whether you view them metaphorically or euphemistically, when I talk about th what Bill Johnson is doing and Mike Bickle is doing or Arius is doing, I, I'm, I'm, I am saying yes. I believe that that is purely of the devil, to assault the clarity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How that, those applications and those means work themselves into daily life, I'm not saying that that is demonic. I do not think the devils are in the airwaves, and I don't think they're in your phone, and I don't think that they're in just a regular sheep who's sitting there listening to a good song. Um, so I would clearly differentiate those. However, I do believe that for those who are lost, because Christ will always protect his remnant, but for those who are lost and listen to those songs, it would be possible for them to go on YouTube, find out where the song comes from, eventually listen to the teaching at the root, and be snared long-term away from Christ through the demonic ploys of those people. How do I support scripturally? Second Peter chapter 1. Um, the, in fact, the whole book of Second Peter. If you just simply read it when you get home, in fact, I'm not, I hate I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it, even be willing to use something like the message version or the NLT, just if you want a quick and easy read, and then simply go online and compare what Peter said these men would be like, and you'll see it. They'll be greedy, they'll be taking advantage of weak-willed women, and they will be doing everything under their own ends. Um, I can give you a story one time before I was converted, I was at TBN hosting a show for Paul Crouch Sr., and um, that whole crazy group that sits on gold chairs. And suddenly Paul Crouch Sr. came walking through. He's the owner of the whole thing. And he had a little servant boy that had to follow behind him with his hand on his shoulder. Everywhere Paul Crouch Sr. went, there was a little servant boy, age 19 or 20, uh, who had to follow him around with his hand on his shoulder. And inside this society of patristic order, these men are viewed as mini-gods. So you read Second Peter, and then you research these people, and you'll quickly see that they are demonic. Great question.